for you. Thank you. That that sounded pretty lovely. Oh my God, who are you talking about? Um, thank you for having me, RC Madaraka. Uh, the only missing part was I'm a Rotarian also from RC Modaiga. And it is my pleasure joining you today. As he has introduced that, uh, me, my passion lies with advocacy for the neurodiverse community, which is one of the few uh, sub -community communities in disability that seems to be forgotten. So I'll dive right to it. And uh, I have a small presentation. That's the best way to actually express what it is and uh, how, how we go about it. One second, so that I can share my screen, then we can get on with it. And you pardon me, a lot of noise, a lot of interruption. Please remember that there are kids who have a lot of energy, and this COVID 19 has not made it any easier with them being locked up in here. Right. So, yeah, as he, as he mentioned, Andy Speaks is an organization that I founded in honor of my son with autism. That's Atu. That's the essence of the name Andy. But the long format behind the, the short Andy is because we advocate, you can see at the bottom, so that there will be integration and uh, we educate the community so and rally for inclusion of persons with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Now, neurodiversity is something that mo not many people are conversant with, but the one fact is all of us are made of, uh, genetic nature is made of neurons. That's how everything communicates. That's how we get to understand and feel and uh, respond also outward and inward. So as you can see with this small man, that is how your body is made. And under neurodevelopmental disabilities, you'll find this is just because a section of uh, during now formation of a child, uh, there is something that could either have been incomplete or doubled or just not gone as it's supposed to be where in our DNA and stuff. So that is what causes the difference. We have cerebral palsy, uh, which is an ab abnormality that affects the brain. And the greatest characteristic you'll find is uh, in movement. Depending on which side of the brain is affected, there will be a lot of se either severe, there are like five types under cerebral palsy, which we call CP. We have uh, Down syndrome, which is uh, during the formation of uh, the DNA, you'll find that one person has an extra chromosome. This is called T21. That's the short form for it. So these children will have characteristics like you see kids with, uh, as we call them, Chinese eyes. They're slit. you find the gap in their eyes is wider than normal. And you will also see their, their hands, uh, the thumb, between the thumb and the rest will be different. And the severe side of it, you'll find that the, most of them will need heart surgery within the first few years of their lives to just keep them going. Then we have ADHD, which is generally excess neurons in the, in the system that the body cannot uh, handle. Then you find children being very hyper. Uh, you remember those kids when you're growing up who uh, we used to call kids and stuff like that. But actually, it is a form of disability. ADHD can be a comorbid either with autism. How do you find it with CP? Because CP affects the entire body. But also, someone with Down syndrome can have ADHD. Then we have autism, which is a, um, an umbrella term for neurodevelopmental conditions. And the funny thing about autism, it is very hard to find two people with the same characteristics, the same symptoms uh, when it comes to autism but what autism affects is four main areas which is your social uh, your social patterns interaction communication so it depends on the it is so that not two people can be identical but you'll find characteristics that are similar that one is an entire topic on its own so i won't even get deeper into it but um, generally, you see the common factor with all this, all, with all this and uh, the, all of them usually have a comorbid where learning then becomes a challenge. So learning disability comes as, as another challenge that they all have. Either you find they can't speak, they can't process, uh, and hence uh, they can easily be confused for deaf for dumb and stuff like that if a parent is not educated. And that's why we are uh, uh, trying to at least raise awareness so that a parent can know within the first five years of a child, it is very important during pregnancy at birth, 
and five years of a child. These are the, the critical areas which anything can, um, if some things happen, you will find your child uh, falling in this. We all always want a, a child who's normal. But what is, we look at the society, is uh, disability has been so promoted as physical, like someone who has a missing limb, someone on crutches, on a wheelchair, and, uh, and, and the likes, albinism. But then you find out this neurodiverse, apart from the few physical characteristics that we have mentioned, and for cerebral palsy, most of them will be on wheelchairs, they look like just any other person walking the street, which makes it very hard and also for let me just show you an example. When we're talking about um, the brain controlling the rest of the body and how it's like for, uh, let's say, now this is an example of now an autistic person. So this is how their world is like. The senses constantly send information to your brain about your surroundings and other people. However, when a person's brain and its senses don't communicate well, the brain can become overwhelmed and confused, affecting how they see the world. Picture yourself walking down the street. This is an autistic brain. They experience the same group. Scary. Isn't it? Sadly, in many cases, the person can't say out loud how they feel. So even though there's chaos going on, they seem okay on the outside, unable to ask for help. So in general, you can imagine, so that is what goes through a person, like uh, this is now specifically for autism, that all these things are going on and we call it like a sensory overload. So the environment plays a very, very big part, in how they react, because you will find because of that, children will develop coping mechanisms. Like, uh, remember Cody, the one who was blind, the, the, the guy who won uh, America's Got Talent last year, and he went, he was like an uh, overnight celebrity. So like for this situation, you find he's blind. So you will always find, most of the time, not always, to find there is comorbid conditions that the neurodiverse will always have. That is where also you will find that they have either convulsive disorders and stuff like that, uh, that which is also epilepsy. So they'll, they'll be coexisting in the same person. So the challenges parents and for two, uh, children um, in a nutshell. Now, like this thing, like cultural stigma. Most people don't understand where it comes from. And also the medical fraternity, though, because the minute you're being told, oh, your child is autistic, your child has this, the first thing is who in your family has it. And how this is visually uh, handled is not something that is very comfortable. It causes a lot of strife in marriages and separations. Actually, 80% of... Um, parents with special needs children are single parents because of the strife and the changes that come and also the cultural African stigma because everyone expects to have a perfect child but not everyone wants to be the one to sit through and see that this child goes through. Did you actually know in the Maasai community they kill them at birth? The minute they find out and even in the sub to Kana in those regions. That's why you'll, you'll hardly see a person with disability in, the, in those cultures. They, they put the child, they realize something is wrong, they put the child at the end of the morning early at the exit of the cows, when the cows are being released to go for herding. So they always say if that child doesn't get trampled to death, then they, that means they have some purpose in life. And if they die, then they just classify it as you were not meant to be. That such is the reality in the African continent and why we are seeking to just have people be informed and be aware and uh, embrace that people are all different. Then the other challenge you'll find in Africa, we have uh, early intervention is not realized in time because most children can actually live a normal life. 
if we get the diagnosis in time. In the US, you can, some of them can be seen even during pregnancy and your advice as a parent. But here in Africa, our ages is around five to 10 years. And remember the brain develops very fast. And if you don't catch it early, you will find that you will lose out. And some of the missed and misdiagnoses we have, we've had children go through uh, ear surgeries as being assumed as death. While all this while is like we've seen, maybe there is that over, over sensory load. And remember, if, like for an autistic person, you change the environment, you put them in something that's confusing. They can even, they, they, they get something called um, mutism. That is, even if they used to talk, they will not be able to talk because you've changed the environment around them. So it used to be called selective mutism because people used to assume it's by choice that they're not talking and there are times that they're talking. Then when you're looking at uh, education also, uh, why we're talking about advocacy being key, all children learn very, very differently. And if you look at our systems, the, the special schools are limited. Our, the schools that are there are not actually equipped. And the few special schools that are there are approximately uh, over 50,000 either per month or in a term, depending on how advanced they are. So you find this is something that's really very expensive and not many people can afford, considering all these other factors that maybe you're a single parent, these children need care, that means you have to stay at home. If we look at something like cerebral palsy, the child totally depends on you because they cannot feed themselves, depending on the severity of it, they cannot move, they cannot even support their head, something as basic as that. Uh, that means they have to have constant caregiving. Because you see now their muscle tones have been affected. They can, and then now, because of that effect, when the communication of between the brain and the body, like I want to move my hand to do this, becomes something that is very difficult. And uh, for, for our special children, you find they will require something, for them to just live a normal life or near normal life, they will require a lot of therapy. For those who cannot talk, they require speech therapy. And if, remember, you can do speech therapy for a long time before the child can actually pick because you never know when they're ready for, for that stage. So you just do what you can. Then we have physiotherapy and we have uh, like OT. All these are very expensive because for a session is around between 1,500 is the cheapest. And this is when you're doing like as a group, let's say under an institution like a school. Uh, but then regularly you walk into a, a hospital, it's around 4,500 a session. That's a session of one hour to two hours and you'll be required to do that three times minimum in a week. So you find raising a special child is like extremely, extremely expensive. And now you're forced with that uh, dilemma of, okay, so do I give them OT? Do I give them speech? Do I take them to school? So that's why you find that most are just locked up, up at home. And then now our government has not put things in place in terms of um, after the early intervention that everyone is doing. So where do they go? We have actually a handful of secondary schools. After that, we're doing TVET for everyone else who's under seated. This, uh, the, like, those, the few who can actually progress, like, you find they are strict class for routine. And if you teach them something the first time, they never forget it. If you say, let's say, this is how a cup is made, they will do it the same way over and over. So they're very good in crafts like that and things like IT. Now, let's give an example in terms of what we're going to, that is now the COVID-19 situation. This graphics was to, to just show you, like we're talking about lockdown, we're talking about the limited number of people in a car and stuff like that. And remember, this is one parent who's trying to take care of, of these children. So that means they cannot move. You've already disrupted their routine. So you have that to pay for in terms of, they will react in ways you don't know. This one is mostly affecting now um, the autistic uh, community and the ADHD. When we look at those, the people with, um, Don, uh, with CP, CP children are still in diapers. It's very few of them that will be toilet trained. So you find the parent has to take care of this child their entire life. So they're always in a wheelchair. They have, they have standing aids, sitting aids. So all these aids that are required to just give them support is usually extremely expensive. And when you're talking about school, without schools in the situations they were, you can imagine now, everyone else has already been put for the TV, the radio. Have we considered this person maybe does not even have the capability of having a TV, getting even the data bundles to be able to access? And even government as they're doing that, there is no, um, there is no 
intervention now for children who have special needs. But then also that can throw a spanner in the works. Looking at the education of diverse uh, persons requires individualized education plans. Not that Kenya applies it as, as such as that's the international standard, but giving you my own example, Andrew has autism, Bradley has ADHD. Bradley is very mechanical and technical, while Andrew is um, very visual. He prefers reading and learning through music and, and, and watching. And he's partially verbal, but Bradley on the other side can express more than Andrew, so he's catching up. And then you have children who have things like dyslexia. This dyslexia is where children have challenges in learning. Uh, this can be even a regular child, but then they have this learning disability. And uh, also this calculia is now where they, they have a hard time with mathematics and they can't just figure all those sequencing things. So then now we are being told to teach these children at home. Okay, I'm a graphic designer. How am I starting to be a teacher, you see? So these are some of the challenges that when we're talking about having inclusion, we, as, a, as a community and as a government, we need to understand who you're dealing with before we just throw in this uh, bracket solution for everyone. And at this time, remember now, there is, with social distancing, all therapies have been uh, interrupted, meaning the children are at a very high risk of regression. Regression in that uh, we've been working to tone the muscles so that they can walk. The longer they stay without it, then we, that means now we are going backwards. By the time we are out of this situation, we have no idea where we'll be with our children. Well, at least other kids can progress, then for you it's harder. Even when, then now, uh, if it comes to learning, there are materials that they use to learn and not every family can afford it. Same with therapy. There are things you can try and do at home, like if it's fine motor skills and stuff like that. You know, the way we take things for granted, something as simple as holding a pen. My nine-year-old cannot hold a pen which is because of what we're talking about now, the neurodiversity side of it, is that communication from the brain to, to, to communicate to the muscle that this is an angle and a specific way of how you need to, to hold it. So there is specific, they're called grippers that teach them and that they insert in a pen so that they're able to hold the pen in a certain way. And even that uh, firmness, that is, it's called fine motor skills. Gross motor is like the same things you do as walking and doing such like stuff like that. Like if it's dressing, he can put on his trousers, but now the fine motor part of it is tying that button, which is something that's not easy for them. And you will find that now those are the things they do in school. So there are things we can continue at home, there are things we are not even able to continue from home. Um, so, and with every time they react to these changes differently. Because, uh, for example, now uh, our regression has been, my son has been eating everything plastic, like combs, cups. Um, he, we, we have several uh, our rulers broken and he chewed. That's because he has a sensory overload he's trying to express. Remember, this child cannot tell you what it is. He used on his clothes, and then now because we are not having speech therapy, the muscle, the muscle toning has also regressed. So he, he's, he's drooling, so he's wet, and it's cold. So all these changes that are going on right now have very diverse and all in all, as we're saying, uh, we need people to, more people to just understand, embrace the difference that this, these children are going through. Because all of us in, are in this state where we're talking about COVID-19, but we also have to embrace the fact that even in that, there are those special groups that are there. We cannot just say persons with disability, because even under disability, we have different uh, quarters that need to be given specific attention. I believe I have tried to summarize it the best I can. So if there are any questions, I'll be willing to take them. And yeah, that, that is generally what neurodiversity is all about. And um, we have YouTube channels that can explain further. In now, like the clip I showed you, there is a full, full clip on that. And uh, other neurodigest, meaning like we've broken down like conditions, uh, in sessions, terms and conditions. And we also have come up with um, a website which is called uh, Special Needs Info Hub, so that people can just generally understand and so that we can support um, caregivers to be able to have access to people like uh, their therapists. Because remember, when you're told your child has this condition, no one sits with you to explain what it is who you need to start with so you always have to just walk it like you're just trying whatever works because all kids are different and no one no one really sits you through or counsels you to tell you this is what it's going to be 
you will need uh, this doctor because we, we have like our support system has the education, has the therapist, like three to four of them. You have nutritionists, you know, and then and then 80 percent of the time, as much as you would say, want to say you have others, it's usually limited. But so we, we're trying to also make the path for the caregiver as easier and uh, more manageable. So that's why we started that uh, side of the, uh, it's called the Info Hub, just one of the projects that we are working on. And in this custom COVID-19 situation, we are trying to give medication for those who get convulsive disorders. So that's the intervention we're trying to look at. Because if I give you someone like who's, let's compare someone who uses a wheelchair or a blind person who can go outside, to them sanitizers will be, will be handy because when they're going out, they need to clean the cane, they need to do all this, they need masks because they're interacting. For us, you will find that limit, that is limited in movement. Moving out is, um, it's almost a no-no. Because if it's hyperactivity, you don't know who will touch, who will go to, what surface will hold. Then even keeping a mask on is almost a mission impossible for a neurodiverse child. And apart from that, you will find like for me right now, what is priority is months old for the rest of his life so inshallah maybe one day we all just pray because sometimes we, we were we were told of oh, five years it will be over but then five years came and went we are almost at 10 and we're still having the same issues so you have hope but you have to also be factual you try and sustain them you try to do the best you can as a parent where the grace comes from god gives you always grace that is sufficient to carry on if you just Focus. I always encourage parents to focus on, on, on the why, focus on what, what, what other thing can we do. So I always say, let's see the, the, the able and not the label of a child. So if a, if a child has this limitation, find out what it is they can do and then build on that instead of just writing them off because the world says so. And I believe that. My closing remark. Thank you. Okay, wow. Uh, Sylvia, I think we've all looked at you in a new light. Uh, I saw your feature, I think, on, uh, was it Citizen? Yeah. yeah, I saw your feature on Citizen a, a, a while ago, and I believe uh, Rotarians in the group have been greatly impacted by your presentation. So I think we'll just go uh, straight into the questions. Uh, I did not give people an opportunity to maybe write their questions on the chat. So I think we can just, anyone who has a question, you can just go ahead uh, for it to Sylvia. Uh, maybe you can raise your hands. Yes, so Beth. Beth, uh, probably we can just kick off with uh, Beth, then Joel, and then we take them as, as they come. Today we have at least, we can give maybe about, 30 or 25 minutes for question and answer. So Beth and uh, Joel, just uh, kick us off. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Beth. Um, <laughs> well, well uh, we, we, we have, we've come a long way. I mean, we were together with Sylvia way back in primary when boarding school together back in Chagoria many years yeah. ago. <laughs> Not a question, but uh, just want to Thank you and appreciate you. Like uh, you're always leading from the front and uh, just want to appreciate your strength and your courage and for at least um, letting, uh, letting us in on your, on your journey. It's really quite impressive and very encouraging to see what you're doing out there and having children who have special needs and how you manage to do it all. I can, I'm, I'm in awe of all that you do and all that you are. Yeah. That's all, thank you. Hey, thanks Beth. Uh, well, Joel has just, jo for your, um, informative talk so we've all learned a lot my question is um, in kenya do we that can help us um these conditions during pregnancy and at pregnancy what's the best time to identify um 
to identify the conditions? And then after birth, is there any specialized treatment or maybe mothers or even mothers in general in how to deal with the, the conditions that you highlighted? Okay. Can I handle them one by one because it can be yes. very wide? Yeah. Okay. Big hospitals some of them, all right? Because it depends, like, in a 3D scan, when it comes to something like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Down syndrome, you can already see the, the thing that I've said, the hole in the heart you should be able to identify. You, you, there is the spasms. Okay, spasms is like the muscles tensing and stuff like that. I believe you see the muscle toning, they should be able to identify. I'm not 100% sure about that. For autism, they say you can actually do a test. I know, uh, for example, like my younger sibling has a child with VS, and when, because there is always fear if you get one, the, the second one will have. But when they did in the UK, they can actually do a test to tell you if your child is going to be normal or is going to have any disability. But in Africa, and you know, you can just send it. And also, there is the danger of uh, interfering with the child. It's not there to detect and identify in, after delivery. You will find something like autism. No one actually knows the, the cause of autism. But it has been stated that genetically, there is a chance of if someone, if it has been in your family, the tendencies or chances of having it is there. There are actually people who are discovering the autistics at the age of 30, 40, because right now there is more awareness. And apart from that, you will find that uh, because of how the community says, like, let's give an example. Aska did a uh, ride for autism awareness last year through a 16 counties. Out of all the doctors we met, only 30% knew what autism is. And remember, these are the same nurses and doctors. We usually go for postnatal, all right? where we're taking our children for assessment of weight, milestones and stuff like that. That is the time they should actually identify and say, this child has not met this milestone. But you know, we always have the assumption of, ah, but the fact that they miss is, autism affects for every one girl, it's one to four. So it gets more to boy than used to girls. So, and then there are things like you notice, like if you're a mother, you see your child has jaundice. You see your child has, you know, the way we always say colic, colic. Actually, the association between the gut and your neural system is very, because insomnia is one of the signs and symptoms. Autism is, a, is like a whole wide topic altogether. But then you see from the stories uh, being in the forum of, of caregivers in all spectrums, you hear the same stories. The other thing will be during delivery, if a doctor makes the wrong move, and damages the brain of the child. That is how CP happens. If let's say the first few months, um, some source of trauma always causes the same. There is a parent whose child actually has cerebral palsy just because a nurse was given the, the duty to remove, you know, the way we get IV, and you have a IV, then a Pardon? Okay, so you find that just that action of delegating a small job as removing that line it affected a child's life. And now you see, who do you run to? How, who do you even sue them? Because I remember, like, in my case, during, it was during delivery. Whatever happened during that CS table, and when you go back and you're told, oh, your file is there, your child's file is not there, you already have so much stress and trauma that you don't have the energy to start suing a hospital or chasing them for things that went wrong. So a lot of uh, parents with special needs children have stories that can make you cry because it's not their fault. It's actually a neglect of a doctor somewhere, especially cerebral palsy, that actually these things happen. Yeah, so there is no said system or support system that we get at in, if my child has a disability, I'll be sent for counseling. No, it's like you're just being told, hey, what's up? You know, I want you to cross this forest, get to the other side and get no map, you just figure your way out. That is how parenting a special needs child feels from the moment you're told they are a special child. I hope that answers your question.
uh, thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I guess we'll take the next uh, two questions. There is one that Joel has posted. No, sorry, Joe. Joe from uh, Kampala Metropolitan. He has posted on the group. Okay, looks like the older men get. Hmm? The older the men get, they tend to produce kids. This a myth or the truth? If it's true, what age in men should we think of not fathering kids to avoid this? I think <laughs> it's just for both genders as it is. <laughs> okay, there is there is always what they say that um, the younger you get, you don't know the scientists say a special child you give. They're about class 25 and 28. Those young age and stuff like that. It's not because even in all, they always the scientists the chances. Are you? Okay, there's another question. Now people have gone to the chat room. <laughs> is wow. there a reason behind high risk than in girls? Um, from what I have read, um, there is it's now this now becomes more of the genetic about the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, right? Uh, but since I cannot authoritatively at this moment speak on it, what I know in the the other also add on that and the infection rate being the other that because we are flooding weight, all right, we are naturally faster. You would work hard, try and achieve the miles. for you to go very easily manipulate the situation to our favor so it's very hard to catch it in girls but then uh, about the the one to four ratio that is purely about genetics and um, the, the mating process I don't remember it a hundred percent so I don't want to speak of what I'm not I cannot give actual facts and figures. I, once I find it, I will share it because I know I have it saved somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tina is asking, is there any insurance company covering these conditions? Well, I can tell you, for example, changing my insurance cover in February and now I'm still being asked for documentation to prove and I, I don't know what they try to get. I've been given a list of tests that are costing like, let's say 20K. So I calculate, I do tests for 20K, uh, a family of four, that's equivalent to almost the insurance by itself. So you will find that some insurances will take, then they will put the asterisks, you know, the way even Safaricom says terms and conditions apply. Then you will be put on a long waiting period. Let's just take a simple example as NHIS. NHIF will cover um, guys with cancer on the, and dialysis and stuff like that. For us, we are fighting hand and mouth just to get therapies covered, right? Just as simple as therapy, because this is what will make my child survive. This is to get their muscles toned. And this is what I'm going to be able to just be a bit more independent, uh, enable me as a caregiver to do other things. But it's not being cut. So those are some of the issues we have. Um, there's a gentleman, last year we had a town hall forum who said he has LC. And uh, when he wanted, no one would take him. But now because he has worked through even schools, no you camp took him. But he, he, he did a course online. Then now he just needed to upgrade it. And he went to a college. All insurance companies are looking for him to take a cover. So he, according to his words, he says, I will never take one because when I needed you, you were not there for me. But that's the story that's everywhere. Getting cover is something that's not easy because they are, I, I, they, they are afraid of something like that 
of uh, liability. All right, I have two people uh, who have raised their hands, uh, one of which is Eunice, so, and then the other one is you for being vulnerable easy and to it trying to bring up uh, getting people out there like it's an I O my heart I know it goes my question is um is there a support group in Kenya that's I know men are also, you can find a single man outside there trying to deal with this or even parents as a whole. Do you, do you, do you know of any support group, you know, does this or any counseling um, services that are offered to these parents? Thank you. You are, what we have, like what, uh, no, uh, neuro, what are they called? Neurologists, pediatric neurologists. So you will find that you cannot access them. So we are depending on each other's experience. So a parent will say, like now with the regression, we have like a few minutes ago, if you hadn't had my son was screaming. So there is this frustration and communication lack of, we have very many parents complaining of that and violence and stuff like that so we share this is what i've done we have children who had been potty trained regressing and now they're they're they're, they're soiling themselves so now you have to think of how else you're going as in it takes you back to zero but then if it is something you're dealt with you have to reintroduce so we're just leaning on each other right now uh, we can have a, um, a support a support center when it comes to just general information and also counseling, because also for you to be a counselor, you have to really understand what us guys are going through. So you will find um, like parents will be going through something, and let's say, let's say he, my area of reference most of the time is with convulsions because my son has had convulsions from when he was what, three months. So we've gone through the system, different medication, different side effects. So from that experience, and then remember also like uh, convulsions are different and they can be diff they are triggered differently. But then the other thing also, I've taken it upon myself, I've done a course to understand. So I've, I've done research in a certificate course in autism, and um, and ADHD so that I am able to help other parents. And on the side of like cerebral palsy, because I'm in their support groups, I'll be able to guide them now with these things that we share in common, like the challenges, the movement, and also from experience like hosting now Neuron Digest, uh, list talk, engaging with specialists, you get to learn. So there is no set system. The government itself, I can tell you now, the voice backing it's now they're trying to do your physical but like in the states in the states they actually have government support in the uk you look at a child you have a actual care worker who will be part of the school be part of the doctors and when we're doing like assessment end of term in a school you find all of them sit together which is something no schools actually do the same way here in kenya i haven't seen one 
because I've visited quite a number to understand it and research. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to like get an elaborate feel of, you know, having, mm -hmm. taking through your nanny through all this training, like mm -hmm. how do you attain this? And is it a case of hiring and firing one or they just, they are not able to handle it? Because the way you've explained, I think it's, it's quite a hand, it takes, it, it's more of a calling, I can say. So, um, what's your experience? Um, for once, okay, God has been faithful, but I have gone through the hand fire within a week because you explain that special stuff, they need this, they need this. You come to face it and a different experience. So you will have for one week, two weeks, the trick is in orientation too, and you look for someone who has prior experience. I always ask that at least someone who has dealt with someone who needs constant care. But you see, now that means also you have to be, have the ability to pay um, very well or something like that. Otherwise, you will find people who will come for the sake of it, then they find they can't deal and they leave, or they will stay and mistreat your child. We have seen very many uh, secret cameras revealing children being swung from one end of the wall to the other, being beaten because they're not eating and stuff like that. All this is just because they take advantage of the fact that this child cannot report. So for me, the one thing I tried to teach my child is to, like physical pain, to to. to express physical pain or if something is wrong at least the bare minimum because they speak they, they do learn some like sign language if you teach them because it's a, you repeat it until they they are able to relate this the same way you t they see a plate they know it's food is the same way you can teach them when something is right or so how you orient them so that they are also able to report i'm i'm, I'm also advantage that my elder child is typical meaning that he will be my csi in the house and tell me because we and he have involved him in the upbringing so he understands the advocacy i do he's part of it if it's if you're coming to sunshine Bradley, he's always there so i've taught him to embrace difference so that he's and, and taught him to stand up for the other children so if you have that support system then it will be easier for you to also return and correcting it in time. It takes time to orient. This week you'll discuss medicine, you'll discuss nutrition, you'll, but there are things like moving um, a fragile child, like a cerebral palsy child, let's say, because you have to reposition them. Remember, they, not most of them can move. So you have to learn to move them from the bed. They have to be on, on the bed for a specific time that is lying down position. If it's on the sitting, how to place them, because remember their wheelchairs are very special. If it's splints for standing, so some of these things you'll find, they combine that a parent, one parent has to be home. But then the sad reality is you're always uh, left. To delegate until when a, a nanny has stayed with you for a specific period of time. I hope that answers you, Yumi. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I can see M's question on the chat. Uh, how sad about the kids being tied up in the remote uh, areas? Um, so awareness has helped to bring such stories to light. But also the other thing with community, it's that we've lost that spirit of Ubuntu and the spirit of like us to to leave my child with you to do an errand and stuff like that. So you see some parents are pushed to such actions tying their kids because of that hyperactivity. And if, if a parent does not understand, like something like the child being hyper and throwing, having a meltdown can be controlled with something as simple as diet. So that's why we're talking, if advocacy is improved and people quite understand that it's a manageable condition and this is the simpler ways of managing it, we'll end up with these things of, because so uh, remember in the video uh, I mentioned about adapting and steaming, steaming his behaviors to calm them down because of the environment so that they are aligned and they can focus. So you find children who get violent, they bang their heads, they, bang, they bite themselves just so as to, to get that out, that discomfort, that frustration of the body. 
So if a parent doesn't understand that, you find them being branded as mentally ill and stuff like that. Well, it's just something as seen as a, a section of what autism is. So that's why we are saying it's about time. We, we come out, we show that this is, this is normal and it can be managed. And that way now, even the parents who do not understand what's going on with their children will be able to embrace them and treat them right. Yeah. Hello? They're very fast. Um, was it after birth? Um, were there any signs at home or was it a condition or was it diagnosed at the hospital just before you went home? Um, <clears throat> first, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, the point of intervention that is diagnosis in Africa is usually delayed because of the assumptions our, 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 our practitioners have. So Andrew had this at birth. After that, he had issues. Uh, he was lactose intolerant, and then he was having forever issues with uh, bloated stomach, process this, he couldn't process that. So those are the telltale signs. So I was seeing a gastroenterologist, but see the gastroenterologist was not linking the two, that this could be autism. And at the point at which I started seeing the twitching, the twitching is now, you, we all know Kifafa, the way the child goes back and rolls eyes and is shaking all over. By the time he was starting, because it starts with a small thing like a twitch, you know, like the way we, we see that thing of the eye and we say we, we have our own meat to it. So you can imagine it in a greater impact. So when I went to the doctor, the doctor says that, ah, maybe it's a habit to die off. And you can imagine this is a six months, three months old child. At that point is the Because of the of electricity. The body because it so that is full blown convulsion at like six months and put on medication. But then you know now there was that weight. We are just managing yeah, that he could he had started crawling, walking, talking, all that disappeared. That's how severe a convulsion can be because it causes brain damage. And all this twitching was small, you know, the brain is being damaged, but no one knows because you have silent seizures that are very dangerous to a child. So I found out about autism when he was three years because it's three years, child doesn't talk. Um, and my dad, when he was like three months, had noticed that his neck wasn't firm, but I had too much stress to even realize that that was an issue at that point with all these other issues he was going through. So when the diagnosis came was around three years, when he was three years, when you're like, okay, he's not playing, he's not doing this, he's not calling me mom and stuff like that. So Andrew actually first called me mom when he was five years old. So that's usually the small milestones we celebrate like nobody's business. Just that one thing we take for granted to us. Hello? Yes. Hello. Yes, Njoki, please ask your question. Uh, my question I, I had put in the chat, I was asking, does um, in the Kenyan hospital scene or medical field, do they give the option of terminating a pregnancy once they detect an abnormality in your fetus? I, I don't think our law allows for that yet. I know in other countries, yes, but but here you, you can, you're not even even abortion, even if it was to be legal. The point at which you allowed only until three months after that, our, our African culture. Oh 
<laughs> oh my god. Okay. I hope that answers. Yes, yes, yes. You've answered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last question from our doctors, Shalene and Mark. And uh, we finalize. So, Shalene, please. Hello. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. That was a very wonderful presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to give a comment on the last uh, question that uh, there's some cases where severe termination, severe, uh, some severe cases where medical termination is allowed. And um, for instance, you find uh, if you discover uh, there's a, a Okay, we call it oligohydramnios, severe oligohydramnios, or um, where you realize probably at around 20 to 24 weeks in our country, so actually less than around 24 weeks, and um, you realize the mom cannot uh, be able to get the baby to till term, till uh, the full 40 weeks. What happens? We are able to advise but they are able to sign a consent. So um, that is possible, but that's a medical termination that is uh, mostly at under 20 weeks and you're able to detect on ultrasound. So the mom will be able to give birth to baby with very severe deformities, which is not compatible with life. Even if uh, they reach term, they're not able to, that child will not survive more than 24 hours. So that's uh, the only, few cases whereby you that medical termination is allowed. However, for well-formed babies, like for example, you can't define uh, autism, it's so hard for you to detect it uh, uh, before birth, then that is not allowed. Thank you. Thank Mark? you, Terry. All right, uh, thank you, Sylvia. Uh, you've broken down those topics in a very brilliant way. I'm a, I'm a dick and I can promise you not many doctors can simplify it the way you did because it's a, it's a really complex topic. Um, however, things are looking brighter. More women are coming to clinics for mm. prenatal. More women are coming for preconception uh, clinics. So you do gene, 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 gene counseling. Huh? So if there's a family the gene typing, you can see if the risk of getting children who have the probability of getting these complications, but not autism. Autism, you no. cannot really tell. As Shall yeah. said, let uh, us go evidence. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, for Down syndrome, you need to take some tissue from the baby when the baby is still in the uterus. Yeah. Okay. And that procedure to the, the baby. So it's it's really complex. But uh, thank you for a good job. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sylvia. Yes. Who there is was this um, me? number one has had raised that someone I know. I know he's blind. Probably he can only do voice and cannot type the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, could assist by um, unmuting him and then. And then we ask, eh? yeah. uh, where did he, okay, I'm seeing him uh, unmute, that's fine. Ah, man, yeah. read all wrong. <laughs> okay, fine. Yes, Moses. Uh, He's unmuted. I don't know whether he's still online. Mm. Both number number one. <laughs> okay, okay, I think we have lost him. We've lost yes. the network there. Okay, no problem. All no. right, sawa sawa. Uh, I will invite uh, Vice President Wilson to give the vote of thanks for this presentation.
Yeah, have I lost Wilson also? Yeah. Hi, Sylvia. Oh. Hi, Will. Hi, Will. Uh, thank you so much for an amazing talk, Sylvia, today. Uh, we at Madaraka really appreciate you. Uh, I think we, I speak for all of us when we say tonight we've been enlightened and challenged by your talk. Uh, thank you very much. No. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work oh, with really? Sylvia during various social activities over the past few years, and I can say without a doubt she's an exceptional woman, and she does a very amazing job, yeah, uh, even in the circumstances. So this is very, very, very good. Sylvia, thank you so much. Thank you for making time to talk to us today. I uh, wish you a lovely Yay. evening. Uh, we would have given you a token. It's just that we are offline right now, but once you come back to our club, there's a token waiting yeah. for you. Thank you so much. Asante Sana Wilson. And uh, thank you once more, Putele uh, and Sylvia. You have uh, really spoken to my heart. Uh, no. I have had I had challenges with my son. I had, we had to go for occupational therapy. So it's something that uh, really resonates uh, towards me. He was born with a congenital heart disease. So something that we've seen. We've seen, we've seen, we've walked the walk, not as intense, but we've taken some steps. Um.